Okay, welcome everybody. I think we have successfully put the panel in the right place. Um, I'm Sarah Burlingame, the Director of Wyoming Equality, and I'm so pleased to be hosting this inaugural conversation, what I hope will be one of many, uh, with my esteemed guests. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, it's Rodeo Week in Cheyenne, and um, out of a uh, surfeit, we're being recorded, uh, a vanity, I am still out here in front of the window in downtown Cheyenne where maybe we're gonna get uh, interrupted by drunken revelers, but that's just a little bit of like Wyoming culture. I think that will add to the whole experience. I'm sort of in my office where I probably should be, but where the lighting makes me look like a Gordon. So um, we are gonna have a conversation with our panelists and we are asking folks to either message me, Sarah Burlingame, message the Wyoming Equality account if you have a question uh, for one of our panelists that you do not want to put out in the public view. Um, we'll be checking those periodically so that after we get through our own little um, panel discussion about faith, the LGBTQ community, community, and suicide prevention, there'll be an opportunity for folks to ask questions. Um, it is a conversation about suicide prevention, so if that is triggering for folks, uh, please step away, um, take whatever space you need. Um, if this is a conversation that you feel like you want to be part of, but you also know that it's gonna present some challenges for you, um, please reach out to your friends, to your family, to mental health providers. Uh, please make sure that you have support if um, talking about faith and suicide and the LGBT community is, is going to present that for you. Certainly, certainly no shame in that. Um, so to get us kicked off, I'm just going to introduce um, our guests, and we're going to start with Father Greg Greitman. Father Greg Greitman is the pastor at St. Bernadette Parish, and he's the administrator of Our Lady of Good Hope Parish in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee in Wisconsin. He's a somatic experiencing practitioner and a pastoral counselor who specializes in the areas of trauma, abuse, sexual trauma, and addiction. In December of 2017, he came out publicly as an openly gay, celibate Catholic priest and has been an advocate for LGBTQ plus individuals throughout the world. Welcome to Father Greg. Hi, everyone. Um, next, let's see who's next on my screen. Next is Dara Goodboy's Elf. Dara Goodboy's Elf is a two-spirit activist from the Wind River Indian Reservation. And Dara speaks about life as a two-spirit person on the reservation. She likes to talk uh, to audiences about the crab bucket theory and her experience of losing her father to suicide at the age of three. Miss Good Voice Elk says, in life, all we ever have are stepping stones to a greater tomorrow. Self-love is the key to self-acceptance. You might also know uh, Miss Good Voice Elk from her work in her gardening initiative that she's been doing on the Wind River uh, Reservation uh, or the poetry that she shares and writes. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Pastor Laura Bethany Buckleiter. Am I saying it right, Buckleiter? Okay. Uh, who graduated from Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis the day before being ordained. And while studying there, Buckleiter served as interim pastor at University Baptist and is an interim pastor of the United Church of Christ Congregation in Wyoming. At a May 23rd ceremony, Laura Bethany Buckleiter was ordained at University Baptist Church in Bloomington, Indiana. The congregation, which left the Southern Baptist Convention in 1999 after accepting a female pastor, is part of the Georgia-based Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, the CBF. Although some reports identify this as a first, Buckleiter clarifies on Facebook, I'm not the first transgender person to be ordained in a Baptist church, and maybe just the second, I'm the first in the CBF church. I'm very grateful for those who've gone before me, and I'm also very aware that we are still pioneers in this space. Um, the pioneer spirit is alive and well in Wyoming. And to close us out, we have a good friend, local guy made good, Jordan Bishop, 
Jordan is the executive director of the Wyoming Interfaith Network, who lives in Laramie, Wyoming. Jordan serves on the vestry at St. Matthew's Episcopal Cathedral and is the newly appointed college ministry coordinator at the Canterbury Fellowship in Laramie. It's a great new gig, and we're super proud of uh, Jordan for hopping over there. Well, thanks, Sarah. I'm, we're happy to be here. Yay. Okay. Um, well, I think to kick us off, what I'd like to do is we'll start with um, Father Greg. And before we get into the question of how our work intersects with suicide and suicide prevention, um, we'd love for our panelists to just tell us a little bit of their journey story. Um, and if the part of your story is how you reconcile being a person of faith and either a member or an ally to the lesbian, gay, two-spirit, trans, and queer community. Um, we'd be grateful to hear your stories. Father Greg, can we start with you? Sure, happy to. First of all, I just want to say it's great to be a part of this, great to be a part of the panelists here. And um, I know in many ways of just being able to uh, be willing to, to talk about this topic. And, um, you know, growing up, uh, I grew up in a very Catholic family and uh, grew up as a member of the Catholic Church. And so it, it, faith has always been an important part. Uh, of my life. However, at the same time, as I was growing up, you begin to have those feelings about being a gay person, and that didn't always mix well in my family history and uh, in the church's history and, and all of that. So, you know, a lot of that was really kept, you know, to myself and and all of that, and I, I know my my the faith. It was more of a hindrance to coming to really accept myself and and all of that. So I, you know, I, I don't want to go into too much detail because I know there's there's so much that could be shared. But I just want to say, you know, when I was 24 years old and I was actually in the seminary, it was on the way to being ordained. Uh, I was two years away from ordination as a, as a priest in the Catholic Church, and um, but it was also at 24 years old when I came out to myself and admitting to myself that I was indeed a gay person, and um, but it wasn't one of those moments that was uh, greeted with great joy and coming to that personal acceptance. There was a lot of self-loathing because of just the time when I grew up, you know, we're talking the 1980s and, and just around that whole whole period. And I, I just, I wasn't open. I wasn't out to many people or anything. And so coming to admit that, I actually had then a suicide attempt. And um, I, I came back from uh, driving, I was visiting someone and on that way, I just admitted. And so I was I was crying and a lot was pouring out of me as a, as a person. Um, and when I got back to my place where I was living, which was at the seminary, I went, it was a um, multi-story building and I just, um, I went into the window and I wanted to jump out. And, you know, it was a three hour process of, discerning did I really want to live or did I not want to live and you know what was less the pain of coming out and telling people and admitting who I was or you know to really just end my life and, uh, and so it was a it was a very difficult time um, but I know at the end of that you know processing and we can talk more about it um, but I just, at the end, I, I came to that place that I wanted to live. And, and I remember that. And that's what led me to crawling out of the window. And so, yeah, I, suicide has uh, affected, you know, it's been a, it's been a uh, part of my life. And 
it hasn't been ongoing, you know, I mean, it was, you know, but having this moment and coming back to that moment and, and knowing that, you know, that, that attempt and, and what it's like to, to face that and what it meant to come out of the closet and come out to myself at that time and eventually to my family and to other people around me. So, but again, we can talk more. I don't want to I'll just give you a little background about my story. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. I'm having this really feeling of, um, you know, I'm just sitting in downtown Cheyenne and you're, you know, halfway across the country in Wisconsin, one of the other W states. Uh, seems like such a simple conversation we're having and yet it's, it's so profound. And um, I'm just imagining the young Catholic men coming up in Wyoming, getting to hear maybe for the first time someone echo their experience. And I just feel very, very grateful for, for your witness. Uh, thanks so much, Father Greg. Uh, Ms. Dara, can you tell us a little bit, like help people get acquainted with um, how you came up in the world? And I know you've spoken before about indigenous spirituality, particularly in terms of the gardening that you're doing and seeing that as being healing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So, um, yeah, I can. So as, you know, as, as Greg was talking, Brother Greg was talking, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, and it took me down memory lane and kind of thinking about my journey, you know, my journey where I've been, you know, what I've been through to become where, to become who I've become, you know, to be where I am today. Um, so my journey has not always been easy, you know, as so many of us, you know, are, has not always been easy. And so where I come from, you know, I've tried so many times to find a place where I belong, you know, where I fit. And so many times it was hard for me to find that because I couldn't find that. There wasn't, there wasn't something that I was looking for. So I was looking for something that wasn't there, I guess. Um, so it was, it was difficult, you know, trying to find, you know, things through faith, you know, for one, you know, I mean, we grew up in the Catholic church, you know, we grew up in the Catholic church and you know, I was even baptized and you know, learned, learned how to balance that out with the traditional teachings of being Native American, you know, things like that. So, you know, trying to find out where I belonged there, you know, that was hard. And then also dealing with, you know, the loss of my father. My father killed himself when I was three years old. Um, you know, the stories that I've told, what have been told is that, you know, he sat in a car and put a hose from the exhaust into the, into the car, you know, and, you know, having to deal with that growing up, you know, being mad at God, being mad at, you know, him being mad at myself and going, you know, in, in, in this triangle form of trying to figure out, you know, well, whose fault is it, you know? Um, so I dealt with that, you know, I dealt with that growing up, it was hard, you know, to, to deal with, you know, I, I resorted a lot to chemical dependency, I resorted a lot to self harm. Um, and, you know, just, putting myself in situations that I didn't need to be in. So now, you know, I guess it took a lot of healing, took a lot of, you know, self-actualization and realization of, you know, well, why did I go through that? Why, why did I, you know, experience these things? Why was my life, you know, put into that path? Um, you know, I, at first, you know, I felt sorry for myself, but then I slowly, you know, began to, I guess, accept the fact that, you know, my dad's not coming back, you know, my dad's not here. You know, he's here in the spiritual form. He, I believe he's been protecting me all this way, but I, I can't ever get that back. So it's, to me, it's just a fantasy. You know, it's a fantasy. Father's Day comes around, things like that. And I'm like, you know, I can't relate. I can't relate to people. And it still hurts. You know, it still hurts today. But, um, you know, what, we, what, what, I've, what, I've, what I've learned in life is, you know, what we need to do is just take everything that we experience, you know, life's experiences, the people we meet, you know, the journeys we take, take all of those experiences and, um, you know, just create, create a collage of memories, you know, that keeps us in growth, you know, keeps us moving forward, you know, because life has that tendency to suck us back so easily, so quickly. And then, you know, the self doubts come in, you know, the, the self, you know, 
self-hate or whatever you want to call it to yourself so what I've learned is you know we have to we have to start within you know we have to start it within you know we have to start loving ourselves you know to look into the mirror you know so many times you know through my transition it was hard for me you know hard for me to to love myself you know so many times I was like you know I'm not beautiful enough I'm not pretty enough you know I don't look like that cover girl model I don't look like that person walking down the street you know and so those types of things you know were were internalized within and so I took everything you know like a grain of salt and I was so fragile I was so fragile that anything would just would shatter me to where you know I would resort back to the bottom of the barrel again so you know being aware of them types of things and recognizing you know when when that type of um you know in, in recovery or whatever they call it stinking thinking but when you start to recognize them types of of, of thoughts and them things so those are the triggers those are the triggers and so those are the things i've learned you know to keep me out of that you know today you know i can live my life to where you know i love myself you know i love myself you know i know that you know, I can't always get everyone to like me, you know, that's just impossible. But, you know, I can be myself and those who are meant to be in my life will be in my life, you know, and those that are not meant to be in my life, you know, will, will find find their way away from my life, you know, and that's that's okay. That's okay. And those are things, you know, we have to learn to be okay with. And sometimes it's hard because social media, you know, I get on social media sometimes and, you know, sometimes if I go in there wearing my, my feelings on my sleeves, you know, I'm going to come out just worse than, than what I went in with. <laughs> and so sometimes, you know, just limiting, limiting ourselves, you know, for, for instance, I have to limit myself, you know, when I start feeling like that, I'm like, okay, you know, I smudge, you know, Native American do smudge. And so I pull out, you know, my sweet grass, I start smudging and, you know, I, I pray for good things for myself so that I'm not thinking bad things for other people because that it has a tendency to do that too yeah are you um, saying if you go on social media and there's a lot of negativity that you smudge for social media i do yeah i smudge for everything i mean just energy is the real thing and and that i think is what is the feel of this world you know that's what that's the drive that's the feel that's that's everything that makes us and shapes us into you know what what's going to become you know and so yeah i think social media has those energies as well. I love that. Thank you. And I know it has to be uh, internalized and everyone has their own journey. But um, every time I see you, I think what a strikingly beautiful woman. <laughs> Thank you. Always. Always. Thank you so much, Daya. Um, Reverend Laura Beth, do you, do you go by Reverend Laura Beth? That's fine. Yes. Yeah. Reverend or pastor works. Okay, we would love to hear from you guys. Yeah, I've, um, wow, I have just appreciate the stories that have been told and just honored to be here with, with y'all right now. Um, I, I was raised in a military family, so moved all over the country. Um, we were just talking with friends, trying to decide if this time in Green River counts as a move and we decided anything over a month will count. So this is move number 29. Um, um, and yeah, military family and a, a pretty conservative Christian family, um, a lot in military chapels, early life in the Methodist church, um, transitioned into cons conservative Presbyterian spaces early in life, um, started my education at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois and um, had lifelong dreams of going to Dallas Theological Seminary and actually lived in Texas for many years working in churches and ministries um, in that more fundamental evangelical context. And um, it was my own brush with um, a moment of suicidality that um, was rock bottom um, for me and that became a turning point. And, uh, having spent a little time in the hospital after um, um, after that moment, uh, the doctors released me with instructions to live more authentically. And for that, it meant not, I had been in therapy for gender dysphoria for about, about eight years at that point and um, working on, on praying it all away and building strong enough faith to fix it and um 
not officially conversion therapy, but for all practical purposes, it was um, all of the guilt and shame and everything that came with the, the spiritual practices there. So um, I was in an outpatient therapy program and I told my therapist that I didn't dealing with the end of a marriage, with coming out, with, you know, just shifting my faith context because it was no longer going to be compatible and not even being aware that there would be a faith context for me to function in. And so I told my therapist that I didn't have enough faith. My faith wasn't big enough to handle all this. And her response just very calmly was that it, perhaps it wasn't that my faith wasn't big enough, but that my idea of God was too small. And so I let God get bigger. And um, I always say that I um, I was always taught that I have a God-shaped hole in my heart that only God could fill. And that in order to fill that God-shaped hole that I built a God-shaped box in my head. And so my faith journey was all about taking the box apart, letting God be God. And that led me into um, Christian mysticism um, understanding, like Dara said, the energy is real. Um, understanding how we relate to the universe, how we relate to nature around us, and um, how we find God in that. What does that mean for the cross? What does that mean for Christ as Christians? And um, that all led me um, back to reviving my vision for seminary and um, to Christian Theological Seminary and studying that. Um, I also studied, I'm a few hours away from being a certified yogi and um, carrying that into my practice um, as well. So lots of exciting things um, on the journey, lots of great stories to tell. I consider myself a storyteller more than a preacher. So if I get long-winded, you guys can mute me somehow if you want to. I don't care. <laughs> We're, we're never going to mute you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura Beth. Ah, this is so good. I'm so happy to be here with you all. Um, Jordan Bishop, do you want to share a little bit of your journey with us? Yeah, well, as Sarah mentioned up top, I'm Jordan Bishop, the executive director of the Wyoming Interfaith Network. For folks that might not be aware, we're a, uh, we're a collection of faith communities around the state that come together in order to serve our communities, pursue social and environmental justice, to come together, learn about each other's traditions, and to see how we can't make Wyoming a better place for everybody to live in. Um, you know, I, as I was listening to these other stories, I was thinking, wow, these stories are so different from my own. Um, I, I just come from such you know, frankly, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was hearing these stories um, was how American Christianity was built for somebody like me. Uh, American Christianity is for somebody that is middle class, white, straight, male. And so in theory, every the, the whole religion thing should just work for me because it's, it's working towards my favor to give me more power and influence. Um, but it was actually that exact thing that drove me away from, from Christianity um, in my early 20s. Uh, just grew up in like a very uh, typical evangelical household. Um, and then kind of also had the very typical response to that when you get to college and being like, yeah, you know what? You're not accepting my friends that are gay, so no thank you. And my mind um, wasn't, I, I just couldn't handle any opposition to that at the time. So I threw, I threw it all away. I just figured none of it was, none of it was redeemable. None of it was okay. And so I threw it all away. Um, luckily, I had some people in my life, some influences. Uh, I, I was introduced to, to authors and queer theology that even me, it's funny for me to say that once again, as like a straight white person that shouldn't necessarily, I don't know, like uh, on paper, you wouldn't think that that would be something that drove me away. But I've always had this sense of if 
if this Jesus figure, I'm coming from a Christian perspective, if this Jesus figure isn't here for the liberation of all of us, then, then Jesus isn't here for the liberation of any of us. And so um, that, that drew me back, that idea and this liberative idea of Jesus um, brought me back into the Christian fold several years ago. And I'm happy to say now I'm a, I am a, an aspirant to holy orders in the Episcopal Church. I am pursuing a master's in divinity at ILF School of Theology. And I can say very clearly, uh, the God that I had growing up and my perception of what Christianity was and who Jesus was growing up was so extremely small. And, you know, as, as Pastor Laura Beth said, I, I've just gotten better at letting God be God. And that is much more liberative and much more compassionate and much greater than anything um, that I could imagine and I can still imagine. So that's a little bit about my journey. Thanks so much, Jordan. Yeah, I, I was recognizing as Jordan said it is, uh, we sound like such a cliche joke, you know, like a Catholic, an indigenous woman, a Congregationalist Baptist and Episcopalian aspirate walk into a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and then they have a great conversation about <laughs> suicide prevention and spirituality. Yay! Um, so uh, thank you all for being so generous in sharing your stories with us. Um, for the next part, before we hit question and answers, we all come from such different spiritual backgrounds. Um, I was raised in the Baha'i faith. Um, I became very involved in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, culturally. Just I blogged on a blog called Mormon Feminist Housewives or Feminist Mormon Housewives. Uh, and then in the last few years, I've really fallen in love with the Catholic Church. Um, I always say I'm a, a, a Jack atheist, like I'm just very bad at it. I go to a lot of church and um, find a lot of beauty there. But also as an LGBTQ advocate, I'm very interested in the faith community because we find so much harm there for our community. And if we're having a conversation about what is the work of Wyoming equality, how do we make life better for lesbian, gay, bisexual, two-spirit, trans, queer, intersex, asexual folks in Wyoming, we kind of have to start with churches. So I guess it, we'll just do this popcorn style if uh, folks who, who want to respond to this. Our, our next question for our panel is about um, your, your personal connection to suicide prevention. And I know some of you shared some of your personal stories in your introductions, but to the suicide prevention piece, and what are the best things that your faith community does right now to support suicide prevention? Whether it's a policy or it's a prayer, whether it's um, you know a, something that you think that your church is just really getting right about acknowledging and addressing suicide prevention across the board, but particularly with the lens on the LGBTQ uh, community. Um, and then we also want to know where do they need to improve? What messages are we hearing from the pulpit or from the leadership or from folks sitting in the pews next to us that do damage? Um, so let's just, whoever wants to jump in there, let's try to make this um, as, as well as we can. It's so hard on Zoom, right? Like just mute and unmute yourself. Make, maybe make this a little bit more of an interactive um, conversation and anybody who wants to take a whack at that can go. Yeah, I don't mind um, kicking that off. Um, <clears throat> I think so much of what, <coughs> excuse me, hang on. So much of um, what happens in the church just focuses around um, building a narrative on behalf of other people. What I mean by that is that the church um, has a tendency to hand you a story that you are supposed to live into. Um, I told my congregation this last weekend as we talked about the 23rd Psalm, 
um, I remember, and I finally remembered it was uh, in one of Rachel Held Evans' books that she talks about um, the uh, um, Proverbs 31 um, and, a, and a rabbi explaining to her that they don't give Proverbs 31 to their young women to tell them how to be a good wife. And if you're not familiar with it, Proverbs 31, just it goes through all of the um, uh, qualities of a what a good wife might look like. But traditionally, they don't give it to their young women to tell them how to be a good wife. They give it to their young men to tell them how to talk about your wife and how to speak about your wife. And we miss that in Western Christianity. We miss that because we we tend to say this is the ideal. And I think, Jordan, you touched on this a little bit. This is the ideal. And if you don't live into the ideal, you need to change your story. You need to fix you to match the ideal. Rather than looking at a God that is big enough and creative enough to have put more than one ideal into the world. And so to me, spiritual abuse, and we can't talk about suicide prevention in the LGBTQ community without talking about spiritual abuse within the context of the church. Spiritual abuse comes when we, who any of us in a position of authority in the church, use that authority to impose a narrative on somebody else that doesn't fit their life. And we run the risk at that point at the very least of making them feel spiritually less than spiritually less than God intended them to feel, at the very worst, unworthy of existing in this world and space that we live in. And so allowing, we as a Christian community have to get better. And, and I'm going to speak to my Baptist background um, in general, but um, we have to get better at helping people find their own narrative, find their own space and their own path um, toward understanding God and then embracing that as part of our larger Christian community. And whether that's in the context of a local church or the larger church in general, but that's a, think, that's just I a kickoff. One thing so, that I've seen, um, like with gardening and stuff, what it's doing is it's awakening ancestral. I keep saying it's, it's awakening that ancestral memory. And so, so many times when it comes to suicide, we're not understanding that suicide also means that, you know, we're, we're killing ourselves with soda. We're killing ourselves with alcohol. We're killing ourselves slowly, you know, slowly. And that's still suicide. That's still suicide because people just don't care. And so... So many times I feel like when it comes to trying to find that outlet so we're not thinking suicide, I think it's, it, it's just difficult sometimes to try to stay engaged. You know, so staying we, engaged so, is, is hard. So Dar, I, I mentioned it and you mentioned it, but will you tell folks, when you say gardening, um, uh, tell them about the project that you're doing. I, it's a much bigger scale than yeah. what I'm doing in my side yard. <laughs> So at the wake of the pandemic, we started a nonprofit from the ground up. We started it, um, it is called Wind River Grower on 307. And it started when we started seeing, you know, the toilet paper go from shelves, the food, the fresh produce, you know, all those things. So I had an idea and I told, you know, my friend Danica Barrett, I said, you know, we got to do something. And at that time, we had just finished some healing work that is geared toward keeping, you know, community and children safe. And so that was called the visioning bear. And so with that, you know, that instilled a lot of the Native American teachings, you know, it included gratitude, respect, you know, taking a look at, you know, ourselves and, you know, keeping ourselves accountable for the wrongs that we've done in life. And so by doing that and finding ourselves, you know, accountable and holding ourselves accountable and holding others accountable, we were able to build better communication, better relationships with, you know, people that we normally wouldn't. You know, and so so doing that was a good thing, but we didn't have the healing tools that we needed, you know, to to sort with, you know, okay, so we exposed our trauma, we brought our trauma to the surface. Now what do we do with it? 
where do we where do we put it where do we who do we give it to who are these people we need to give it to and you know we didn't have them skills we didn't have them tools and so you know that kind of just went it went down it went down and so you know we came up with this next idea you know we'll we'll include gardening you know because you know people need fresh food you know our people deal with diabetes our people are dealing with cancer you know our people are dealing with you know obesity so all of these things we wanted to, you know, try to eliminate. And so growing your own food is better than buying it from the grocery store. You know, it's better than having all of those, you know, those, those herbicides and pesticides that they use out in those fields, because those are what are causing our cancers. You know, and so a lot of that, you know, we included, you know, I wanted to include the traditional foods. So we included, you know, choke cherries, we included, you know, sagebrush tea, we included cedar tea, we included, you know, all these other roots and, and, and berries and leaves and everything that you can do. And all of it is made into teas and all of it is put into food. And so these are the things that are eliminating, you know, a lot of, a lot of the things that we have today. How long have so, you been doing that, Diane? So I started doing this, I started on the growing resilience. I started when they started that with University of Wyoming, I was on the board for that. And then once I stepped down to finish my degree with Central Wyoming College, which I completed in psychology and communication, um, you know, that's when, you know, I, I, I knew I wanted to do something, you know, it's hard to be on a board that doesn't support your dream. You know, it's hard to do that. And so I had to step away so that I could, you know, make my, my dream through, through Kate. You know, I had to make it into what it is today. Dara, you are doing it. You are doing all the things. We're so proud of you. Uh, Father Greg, I don't think I have shared this with you, but I have said in the past that, um, you know, I really struggled at Wyoming Equality for a while there, particularly after a close friend of mine um, uh, died by suicide. Uh, to have conversations with faith leaders uh, about uh, suicide prevention and how desperate the need was here in Wyoming. Um, I think after uh, Trevor O'Brien's death up in Gillette, it became particularly hard for me, but I especially appreciated the Catholic Church and I especially appreciated the Catholic Church's teachings in, in this instance on the dignity of the human person and the emphasis that they place on life. I found it very disheartening um, in a few conversations that I had with um, some evangelical uh, pastors uh, who I was attempting to have good conversations with and just felt like uh, there was a casualness that they dismissed uh, the suicide of LGBTQ people of you know the lives and deaths um, of our community and i was so heartened to find the sincerity and the depth with my new catholic partners um so I'd, I'd love for you to answer that question about you know what the catholic church is doing right the teachings it has that is doing um you know it's best to address this and then maybe where you see some places that um harm is being done before Father Greg, if I can interrupt for a second. Go ahead. Yeah, sir, can you just throw the statistics out and I kind of, I feel like they get out a lot, but just for the sake of anyone who might not have ever heard them, do you know what I'm referring to as far as the suicide rate within the LGBTQ community? Oh, yeah. You know, I, 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 I have, I mean, I've seen different statistics for it, but I, I okay. guess so, so the more recent, the more recent statistics, and these are, I mean, studies on this are difficult on many levels. So, um, certainly a margin of error here, but on, on a national average, the suicide rate is about one and a half percent among the general population. Um, uh, you at uh, veterans of the military, it's about 7%. So combat veterans, about a 7% suicide rate incredibly way too high um, lgbtq people the suicide rate is about 11 percent so um and if you narrow that down to those that identify in a faith community um it jumps up to 
more in the 20% range. Of transgender LGBTQ, of transgender people within the LGBTQ community, um, it's a, more around the range of 25 to 30%. And up to 45 to 50% have had some form of suicidal ideation. And so I, I just thought that was important to get out here. And thank you, Father Greg, for making space for that. Just to, like you say, this isn't casual. This isn't something that we just bring up and um, say a prayer about every now and then. This is a real life problem. It's a real life, deep rooted problem that is complicated deeply by the church in America. But yeah. so. No, thank you. And thank you for bringing that to light. And, you know, as we all know, suicide is the second leading cause between people 18 to 24. I mean, so we, they're, they're, this is a serious issue that touches many people, many families, many communities, many churches. And so, you know, there are times and places, um, you know, I, I'm going to speak obviously from the Catholic tradition because that's what I know and have come up in and grown up in. So you will say as you, there are some best of things that are going on that are, are really wonderful and uh, a real awareness. And, you know, there's, there's very good spirituality. There can be a very good uh, response to mental health issues and concerns from that. The pastoral care that sometimes happens with people who are, in relationship to struggling mental health issues and all of that, um, you know, but again, coming from the perspective of upholding the dignity of every person and all of that that you were referring to and some of the social justice teaching and all that. So that can be there as I, you know, even recently said in a, a national interview, you know, this is this is the place, this is my home. Because sometimes people say, well, why did you even stay as an LGBT person? Why did you even stay in the church, you know? And some of these questions, but I'm like, but this is my home, you know? And, uh, you know, and I really feel strongly about that. And, you know, and, and so, but it's also not been the best of, uh, at the, you know, there's the worst of because, as, um, you know, even as Laura Beth was saying here, you know, the, the church can also be the place of great shame, which is, you know, the source of my own suicide attempt, you know, it's like, it didn't help me to understand what it meant to grow up as a gay person, you know, to hear my story, to accept me, you know, we, we can say, oh, yeah, we uphold the dignity of every person. But then at the same time, if we're not accepting, you know, oh, well, I'm sorry, I don't like your story, or I don't like the, you know, this aspect. So why don't you try changing it? We know churches that have been involved in conversion therapy and, and all this just because of, self-loathing, self-hatred, and wanting to switch, and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, but, you know, that's not accepting the story, it's not accepting the people where they're at, and, you know, one of those statistics that I bring up being a priest uh, is just the reality of the number of uh, gay priests that we have, you know, we can't even be honest about this, you know, I mean, uh, in the percentages, so we don't really want to know, so we're not going to really listen to stories and help people understand it. We're going to help people to be silent and quiet and live in the closet and, and do that. Well, that's not upholding the dignity of the person. So, you know, it, it can be that both and. I have found in my own life now since I came out in 2017 in December and have been publicly out in the open about this just the freedom and you know for people to see there are people in all walks of life yes including the priesthood that you know are in the LGBTQ community and you know and to see that and I get these letters from people all over the world uh, you know, I, I, I say, you know, uh, jokingly that, you know, nobody ever really listened to any homily and no homily ever went national or international, but I put three words in a homily and it tran you know, just when, you know, across the globe, you know, when you say I am gay, boom, you know, all of a sudden this went way out there. 
So, but you know, the honesty and when I think about it, what people want from their church, wouldn't it be honesty? But you know, so that kind of, when we are at our best, it's when we're most honest and we can do that. So in my preaching, you know, even in April, at first I was thinking uh, April was Suicide Awareness Month, but it just in my head when I was leading up to that, but I realized, no, oh, no, that's in September. So, but anyways, I tied stress awareness, suicide awareness, May as mental health awareness. So I just tied them all into a homily. And I told my story, you know, and I'm just like, you know, this is, this is part of who I am. This is my, you know, I, I had a suicide attempt, you know, so if we're going to talk about anxiety and we're going to talk about stress and we're going to talk about depression, and if we're going to talk about, um, you know, these areas of mental health and concerns about that, well, then, you know what, these are, these are real struggles that people are having, you know, and even in COVID, we learned that people were struggling even more. So I'm like, we have to be honest, just listen, maybe you can just be there, you know, and I, you know, I talked about my suicide attempt, I said, when I came out of the window, and I went to a friend, and I told him, this person listened. And he told me it was going to be okay. And he's like, you know, I will walk with you. We'll get you the help you need. And, you know, it's like, that's what I needed. I, I just needed someone who was with me and would stand by. So that's when we can be our best, when we really listen, when we journey with people in their struggles of life. But condemning people and all of that and, you know, just calling oh, it's all a sin and, uh, you know, that stuff, that judgment, that's not helping. You know, the shaming part of our culture is, is not, um, is, is that's, that's the aspect that's not helpful. Whether it comes from a church, whether it's coming from our society, whether it comes from a city, wherever that's coming from, that, you know, that's, that's not helping. And what I've learned is, you know, shaming is a control technique. You know, and they use that against us. You know, they use that to keep control over us. So, you know, that's something that a lot of us need to break out of, you know, not just, you know, for, you know, this walk of life, but for like, you know, all walks, you know. I just thanks, wanted to say that. Thanks, Father Greg. Um, Jordan, if folks don't know, the Episcopal Diocese here in Wyoming has a pretty significant mission to address suicide prevention in Wyoming. Can you tell us a little bit about that and like just where you see, um, you know, it's working well and, and maybe what some of the growing edges are? And thank you so much for all of that, Father Greg. I'm recording this so I can go back and listen and like take notes on it. This is amazing. Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks everybody else for sharing too. I, I, it's, it's a blessing to be here and to learn from, from y'all and just to be a part of the conversation. Um, uh, as Sarah mentioned, the Episcopal uh, Church in Wyoming has um, put quite uh, an effort in previous years. Our previous bishop um, uh, ha has put quite a bit of focus on suicide prevention. Um, we're, we're lucky enough in our diocese to have the Episcopal Foundation in Wyoming, which is able to give quite a bit of money towards uh, nonprofits and other causes to address um, suicide in our state. Um, and it's also, I can tell you as somebody that's, that's going through the process of ordination right now, it's something that's, um, very explicitly outlined in the process. Um, and, uh, there, there's quite strict guidelines for, uh, training as far as that, that clergy have to go through. And, and I think that's a big starting point of it is, is the education is training of our faith leaders, um, so when they are in situations with folks that might have suicidal ideation, um, to be able to properly handle that. Uh, I think that's a, that's a big starting point. I'd like to speak to just a little bit towards, I work with a lot of faith communities around the state, not just the Episcopal Church, and thinking about, well, how can we leverage the resources that we have to help address this issue. And really, I mean, Father Greg kind of nailed it, I think, is holding space. And if, 
you know, if anything, in, in Wyoming, if you're a faith community, you have space, right? Um, you might not have the numbers in the congregation that you want. You might not have all the money that you want. But generally, folks have space um, that's been handed down to them. And so that is a blessing in itself, um, is, is to have the space, um, a sacred space, um, to hold conversations. And, and I can tell you, these are... These are conversations that people are, young people in particular who I work with, they're itching to have these conversations. They are hungry for it. And what drives a lot of people away from uh, religion and more specifically Christianity is the sort of, frankly, the bullshit that people can, can smell um, from religious leaders and religious communities, the inauthenticity. And so one thing that I would challenge faith leaders across the state that wanting to do is get trained. There's training available on, <laughs> on suicide prevention and then uh, authentically hold space for folks to have conversations and lead those conversations and know, because I certainly have, that you will make mistakes in, in leading conversations um, and knowing that that's okay too, because we're not gonna be perfect and we just we have to push forward and, and take that first step in, in holding space for these conversations. And then after that, I mean, we could go on and talk about the importance of liturgy, the importance of theology that also uh, are, are into that conversation as well. But I think it starts out with just having a cup of coffee, um, you know, sitting across from somebody and hearing their story. Ours is a very food-based theology in Wyoming, whatever denomination you are. We're very big on, could we share a meal together? Could we have a cup of coffee together? <laughs> um, amen, amen. Um, so Jordan brought up, you know, kind of Wyoming specific stuff. And I know that, you know, Laura Beth, you've just moved here and Father Greg, you're over in one of the other W's, Wisconsin. But something that came up recently up in Campbell County was um, some pretty serious misinformation that came from faith leaders and members of faith community up in Campbell County. Um, and it centered around the library up in Gillette um, low key, the lowest key celebrating Pride Month by just saying on social media, hey, June is reading Rainbow. We have these books in our library. <laughs> um, and the response to that that we saw at the county commissioner's meeting was just person after person who came up and either stated that they were a pastor themselves or they had some kind of um, faith leadership in their churches. Um, but they all checked their Christian faith as something that was very important to them. And then said, you can't have these kind of books affirming gender identity and sexual orientation because it will lead to suicide. That these kind of books are confusing for youth and they lead to confusion, which leads to unhappiness, which leads to suicide. And I think for everyone here, we're, you know, we're all just aware that like, Emily is that like misinformation it's opposite, right? It's opposite, um, things that affirm your faith. But in that case, when faith leaders are leading the charge in, in saying um, things that do harm to the LGBTQ community and do harm to getting out correct information about ways that we can address um, a suicide problem. Uh, Sarah, who, who is I think... I think that, okay, so here's some thoughts that I had as we're talking. And so I think what needs to happen is it needs to be more than just, because uh, so many times, here's my thoughts. So many times, a lot of us, you know, yeah, we want to make a connection. We want to go and we want to talk to people, but we make dates and we don't follow through because maybe anxiety got the best of us. You know, and so, so many times our people here today in this world that we live in with technology, a lot of the connection needs to happen like via Zoom and, and you know, not in person. It needs to happen, you know, phone calls or via Zoom where people are, can be comfortable in their own environments and talk about what they need to talk about. 
I think that is one thing. Um, I don't think it needs to be in person because like meeting a new person, if I was to go like, hey, I'm going to go out and meet somebody, I'm going to get social anxiety like crazy because I don't know who this person is and I don't know what I'm going to say. And so I'm just going to back out. And so that... I you think don't know if they're going to be harmful to you, right? Okay? Like, you right. Don't know if they're going to meet you with that same spirit of like curiosity and kindness that you're extending to them. Or like, I mean, I've certainly been in meetings with faith leaders where and I've said this before, like if they did a metaphysical CAT scan of me, like there would be a chunk missing from my soul. Like, right. I just, yeah, I guess I'm going to be from a different community, I guess, because I mean, I guess in, in my background here in my community, it's more like people are on edge of who you can trust and who you can tell things to, who you can say anything. So that has a drastic effect on my thinking, my brain, and a lot of the people that are here. And that's that crab bucket theory is what I'm what I was talking about. You know, and, and so like what we put into what we what we feed ourselves, what we read, what we watch, the music we listen, you know, the books we read, all of that is shaping our brain into, you know, what kind of manifestation we want for ourselves. And so, so many times, you know, a lot of us, like in my community, I'm talking about the younger people and, and the things that I see, like on social media, social media is a big thing, Snapchat, you know, these types of things. You know, those are the things that are transforming and shaping the brains of everyone. So we need to take a look at that and change the way and the things that we're giving ourselves or feeding ourselves, you know, and, and in the church, they talk about it, are the bodies, the temple, you know, it's what you feed yourself, what you give yourself. That's, that's how you're going to make yourself healthy. I think, uh, I really appreciate all of that, Dara. And, um, there's, I think, and I think, Sarah, you and I talked about this in our earlier conversation this week. We were dealing with an issue of causation here as far as what was happening up in Campbell County. And also, too, back to what Jordan was saying and um, about, um, yes, there's training available. Yes, there are higher level of thinking that can happen in suicide prevention. But before any of that, and I'm talking like is soon, you're the next time a pastor picks up a phone or the next time one of us writes a sermon or prays with somebody. We really, when I started seminary, I made two plaques, one for my, one of my closest friends who uh, started medical school the same week I did, and one for me. And both of them had emblems of our schools, and they both said, first, do no harm. And I think that's where we need to start. We need to start at the idea that our job as faith leaders is to first do no harm. And then to understand that, we have to understand what harm looks like. Um, we use a lot of terms like tough love and um, rooting out the sin. And we, we mask that as loving when it's truly, truly harmful in those spaces. Um, the other thing that we really have to understand is the nature of gender and sexuality. And when we start saying things like the book, you know, these books lead to suicidal thoughts and ideation, um, we start with something. I 100% agree with you, Dara. What we put into us is so important as how we nurture what we have been given. Um, but I spent 10 years in therapy putting different things into me, putting things into me that my faith tradition and I even myself truly believed were going to fix, were going to change, were going to shift who I was. And it wasn't until after I came out as a trans woman and after I shifted some medical practices and practitioners that through some surgeries and some corrective things, not even dealing with gender, we discovered an intersex condition and where I was actually born with testicles and ovaries. And my body this entire time was trying to say, you don't, you don't fit their story. You don't even fit the presumptions that the doctors have when they look at an MRI about you. You have to change what you're expecting out of your body. And what these, what I feel like when people are saying, you know, if the, the suggestion 
of gender affirmation, the suggestion of conversations around anything other than cis heteronormative sexuality is, is, is what's leading to this idea. They're denying the fact that it's deeper in us than our culture. This is a nature issue, not just a nurture issue. And we have to approach our spirituality with that. And we, in order to do that, we have to let God be the creative one who put that nature in there in the first place. I have to accept the fact that I'm not a mistake. I am intentionally, lovingly, knowingly created by God and a product of a universe that loves and embraces me. I would say, and this is this comes with a lot of privilege. And I again, Dara, I appreciate you you calling this out. Um, I operate on an assumption of acceptance. I can I get to go into a place assuming I'm going to be accepted, and if they're not accepting of me, it's up to them. They either have to deal with it silently, or they have to confront. I've done all the coming out I'm going to do. <laughs> That's not true. I'm sure I'll come out of something else later, but it's their turn. And I think that comes and, and I qualify that all the time, saying that comes with a lot of privilege, um, a lot of economic privilege, a lot of racial privilege, um, ethnic privilege. Um, and at the same time, I, I hope that we as a community can learn um, to to be more in that space. Not that I'm getting it right, but that we as a community can be given more freedom, that that's not an assumption um, or it's a, it's a safer and safer assumption. It's That's not the truth in the church. Well, something that strikes me in this conversation too was if you go back to each one of us and we heard our stories from what we first said in our conversation today, was for most of us, our understanding of God was too small, you know, and, you know, we had to, as individuals, grow bigger, and that understanding, you know, and realize that it was too small of thinking. So when I hear this episode, and I wasn't aware, you know, fully of it all being here in Wisconsin, but, you know, when I hear stories like this replicated, you know, not just in our own nation, but around the world, it's like, you know what, some people's thinking about sexuality and about God and human development, it's too small. I mean, they're, 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 they can't take in any awareness of the larger issues of nature and, you know, understanding sexuality and sexual development and all of that. So, you know, and just a real quick example, you know, somebody was writing a whole um, series on sexuality and sexual development. And in there was trying to figure out that maybe around 10th grade, they were going to mention something about uh, homosexuality. And I'm like, it's way too late. You know? and, and I'm like, forget it, you know, by 10th grade, you know, it should be much earlier. And, and but again, well, I'm sorry, if I want to get it published in the church, you know, they don't even want it in there. And so I'm like, again, too small of thinking. We, we, we can't have the small thinking is what leads people to problems with the larger topic we're talking here today of suicide. Because people can't, you know, they're not listening, you know, you feel, feel like a misfit or you don't fit in. There's something wrong with me when there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, and so... That would be my my sense. We we got to look at this in a larger perspective and and help people to continue to expand their repertoire of knowledge. I think I think really sexuality is different for everyone, and I say that just because you know I remember as me growing up, you know I I, I was you know a gay man growing up and you know trying to find out who I was. And so, you know, it took more transition from when I became that into, you know, being a woman. And so it was kind of hard and it was difficult because it was hard for me to get, you know, people to understand, you know, the point of view that I was because I was getting judged by the gay men. I was getting judged by, 
you know, so it, it was hard for me to find my place. You know, it was hard for me to find my place, find my voice. And so sometimes, like even today, I, I notice and I recognize, you know, it's hard for me to tone it down sometimes. I always tell people that's that's the man in me because I, I talk kind of loud and I talk kind of, you know, rambunctious. But, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to turn that tone that down because to me, I mean, it's always it's always made people pay attention. Oh, Dara, I'm a cisgender woman and you know I'm loud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all the ways you are. Um, I would love to hear from all of you on something I've been wrestling with. I've, I've been waiting for questions to come in and questions aren't gonna com are coming in. So I'm just gonna ask my own questions, which is, um, I, I'm wondering if maybe it's too reductive, but lately I've been thinking about clergy who are in the closet, clergy who are acting out their own homophobia, you know, their own self-hatred, um, and you know the hostility that that produces but it, what's got my gears turning is you know what father craig and you know what uh, pastor laura beth and what all of you have echoed is this idea of god being too small god or however you conceptualize it and i just think like if there isn't a place for them if there isn't a place for them in their church in their faith community if there isn't a place for them in their own heart Right? Like if there's not a place, even in the silence of their own heart, that they can see themselves with an innate uh, sexuality or gender expression that is beloved and known and n not just not shamed, but beloved, then I've just been thinking, you know, like, how can they extend that to anybody else? They have to keep making it smaller. They have to keep denying our existence. They have to keep saying that, you know, you have to be corralled back into this um, fictional narrative of, of, a, of a tight binary in order to receive that love and that grace. Um, maybe, I, don't, I, I don't know if that's too reductive. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, how you think about and, and speak to people who are acting out of their own pain not just being assholes, but acting out of their own pain, which to me is different. <laughs> yeah, I always have said as, um, is the, the whole issue around spiritual abuse and church hurt is for me personally, not, not only have I been a victim of it, I've been a per 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 <laughs> perpetrator of it. As a pastor, as a faith leader, um before i came out and uh, unfortunately even since then i mean it's it comes with the territory and we can only do we can only do no harm when we are aware of what harm is and that sometimes doesn't come until after the fact um the uh um but to i mean to your to your question i i'm looking at the methodist church right now um, in the United States and what they're going through. And I'm really curious to see how many people, how many Methodist pastors we see coming out um, once they um, are in a faith community that will allow them to do so. Um, and, I, and I think, I mean, my journey, I think, reflects a lot of this is it had to become, it had, it had to come to a place of self-acceptance where I was willing to walk away from the faith community that didn't accept me. Um, and I was partially able to do that because at that point I had no financial ties. I wasn't, I was working part-time um, on a church plant that I wasn't getting paid for. And I think so often these pastors are so tied to the money that comes through their churches, that if they were to come out, even to come out as affirming, we have seen pastors lose their jobs, lose their churches, lose the financial structure that holds their churches up. And um, I mean, so there's an issue of self-acceptance that they need to come to, a self-acceptance to the point of being able and willing to walk away from a space that doesn't affirm them, and then to be able to it's a whole nother level to have the self-confidence and the self-awareness and the 
the knowledge base and the skill base to advocate within that faith community you know for greater acceptance so um i understand what you're saying and it, it is kind of reductive and I'm, for the sake of the question it had to be um, but there are so many layers um to what that is does coming out mean i'm no longer a pastor or a faith leader does coming out mean i'm going to be a faith leader in this community instead of that one does coming out mean i'm going to stay here and i'm going to be a noisy son of a bitch until people start listening to me um there's no right answer to that question except as the doctor told me and actually as my pastor told me when she ordained me people living in truth speak truth mm. people living outside of truth are never truly going to speak truth Father Greg, I like I was not going to ask the question, but I feel like after Laura Beth just teed it up for me and and, and like let's say it's the spirit. Okay. <laughs> I what she just said, right? Like if you are not living truth, you cannot speak truth, you cannot preach truth. There is a scandal unfolding in the Catholic Church right now with a a terrible sort of conflation of wild invasion of privacy. Um, a Monsignor was publicly outed by a very conservative Catholic um, publication who apparently paid for his data and tracked him in what is at the very minimum a breach of any kind of journalism, but also like raises up this question that we have of um, what are the fruits of, of, of living a repressed, shameful, divided life when you can't speak your truth and still um, be accepted by your community? Do you want to take a whack at that one? Do I have an hour? <laughs> no, gosh. no, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's a very involved uh, question, but you know, what I would just say to that is, uh, again, coming back to my own personal journey, this was my conflict, okay? I, it's like, I can't live this way anymore. I, I can't keep living and pretending that I am something that I'm not. And, you know, uh, John Bradshaw, who I, I loved reading, and, you know, John Bradshaw has this wonderful comment, you know, if we're going to just create, be creating all of these false selves, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, what Pastor Laura Beth just said, it, we're not living in truth. You're, you, the, you know, and hell is really not knowing who you are and being able, ever able to be living that out in one's life. And so, you know, that was the part, but, and, and, uh, you know, the comment that just came up a little bit ago it, it is really there. You know, I had to think about if I'm going to come out publicly, I was ready to lay it all on the line to the point where, you know what, I may lose my position. And because there are priests who have come out and they've lost their, their churches, their parishes, or their you know, whatever ministry they were doing because uh, of doing so. And, and then it gets couched into some terms, as one bishop once said, oh, we're not removing you because you're gay. We're removing you because of your gay activism or, you know, so it's like, yeah, well, you're still removing him because he's gay, you know, <laughs> let's get to the, the, the truth here, you know, this is, you know, if you're going to split lines. So what it forces then is a culture of secrecy and it's a culture of silence and it's a culture of many people pretending well, this isn't me. And then you get some who take it even further, who are, you know, they have repressed it so much in their life. Well, not to draw attention to themselves are going to really take it out against the community and against other people. So, you know, and so now they weaponize it in from their pulpits and you know their speech and hate speech and so this self-loathing is now projected onto others in the community and comes out in so many different ways as well so this is a it is a huge problem i mean it you know it's i still think it's the scandal within my church that we have to start wrestling with because you can't keep repressing people in their sexuality and not expect 
that, you know, whether somebody's going to act it out in different ways and all that. So I, I could say it's not just a simple five minute answer to this question, but it gets to the heart of the matter that we, you know, we have to live in honesty, you know, and, you know, we can, if you're going to speak truth, you better be living it. Uh, because, you know, if it's duplicity, you know, and a secret life and all that, well, that's not reflecting, uh, you know, it's going to come out in other ways. And then, then that brings another scandal in of itself. Thank Father Greg. I had told myself that I was going to ask right. that question because I didn't prepare you for it at all. And that it would be, you know, maybe mildly unethical to just spring on you, hey, there's a new scandal. So that was very generous of you, Father Greg. Thank you, Jaya. And then I think uh, Jordan had something to say. So like the talking just makes me think about, okay, so when I was younger, you know, when I was growing up, I remember, you know, I used to get picked on by the other boys, you know, I used to get picked on, get called names, you know, queer, faggot, you know, all these names. But now that I look at it, the ones that were really picking on me, those were the ones that are gay, they were gay. And so they had things within themselves. And so they were, they were projecting it onto me. So it made me think about that, you know, um, made me really, you know, think about that. And then another thing it made me think about, so, so I, I'm an author, I'm an author of, of four books. And so in one of my books, one of my chapters is, you know, don't talk about it, be about it, you know? And so, so many times, you know, we, we plan things or we talk about things, but it don't come into fruitation because we're exposing it, you know, we're exposing it. And so many times we have to, we have to protect that, you know, we have to protect that. So I don't know. So those type of things, I think, you know, again, it goes back to the energy. It goes back to, you know, wanting to know what it is we want to manifest. So I don't know. That's all I got. That's good jam. As Shakespeare would say, me thinks that us protest too much. Jordan, did you have? You know, I, I don't, uh, on this topic in particular, I don't have much to, to contribute. I think it's been pretty well um, laid out by, by the other panelists. Um, how much time do we have left, Sarah? Just curious. So we, we've got about 10 minutes left and I am gonna ask everybody when we um, close out to just speak from your faith tradition and if there are folks, um, uh, listening or watching this later, um, uh, members I, of faith tradition and struggling with whether, you know, they have a place in the community. Uh, if you could just address them. And, and if, their I, community. if I could just ask Father Greg another question, let's put you on the spot again. But um, the, uh, um, and I think it's an important piece of this to bring out as we're talking about people's narratives and self-acceptance. And you introduce yourself as a celibate gay man. Um, which I, I truly respect. Um, I also um, have been called and respected by some um, for living a celibate life, but I have to tell people that my celibacy is not a spiritual calling. It's a complete lack of game. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it, my life has been busy. I've been getting to know me. I've been in school. I've been recalibrating my idea of ministry. And so um, pursuing relationships um, has really just not, not been on the table. It's not because I feel a life calling to that. Um, do you, so when you introduce yourself as a celibate gay man, I see that as a very important thing in your position as a priest, because you're, you acknowledged a call to celibacy even before acknowledging that you were a gay man. Do you see those two as different? Or can, I don't even know how I'm phrasing the question. Do you see those as separate um, issues, your call to celibacy and your identity as a gay man? Yeah. Well, I, I think part of my identifying in that way is first and foremost, my religious tradition requires celibacy. So, I mean, that's just uh, part of the requirement. I think the other issue is, 
I have found that even when I mentioned that I'm a gay man, everybody thinks that you are sexually active, like I'm sleeping with someone different every night. Right. You know, I mean, and so again, these crazy stereotypes that people have. And so, you know, I've been, I've done different inter radio interviews. And uh, so I'll talk about being an openly gay priest. And they're like, you know, and then again, they're like, well, how can you be saying that? You know, you can't be sexual. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, so it, it's just, it's the craziness of, of how people address this topic. And, and that so many, again, if we're going to talk about narrow mindedness, when people are approaching the LGBTQ community to, um, to make, you know, and even pronounce someone that they're gay does not mean that, you know, <laughs> That they're having sex every night and every hour right. but you know these are just the images that come to people's mind so yeah. it's, it's unfortunate so that's why i'm very explicit to put out there that right up front but absolutely yeah i completely understand that. I, I describe myself as a theoretical lesbian sometimes i just haven't <laughs> taken the time to prove it yet um but you would not use celibacy as a prescription for someone for an lgbtq christian is that a fair statement correct i, I okay. say it from the stand well i mean my church would but you know <laughs> so, well sure uh, yeah we're going to be you know talking about that but the yeah. reality of it is i mean it's a because then if you're going to say what's natural uh and if this is who the person is in their nature then you're going to say well what's natural for a gay person well they're going to be you know attached to someone else who's gay and you know and have a relationship et cetera, et cetera. but right. nevertheless no i'm i don't use it as a sense but uh in my life that is what i have chosen you know if i absolutely ever yeah fell in love with someone and i wanted to do that well then I would step aside because in my tradition, I'm not allowed to be married, you know, so in doing that. So for me, it's for me and my, yeah. you know, development. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And again, as we are talking about narratives and allowing people to own their narratives and not imposing ours on people or submitting ourselves needlessly to someone else's narrative, I think it's really important that those those types of nuances be given given space so thanks for thanks for letting me put you on the spot there i appreciate that it's not just me putting father greg on the spot so thank you pastor Lorna Beth, making me look good <laughs> um folks this has been an amazing conversation i know i'm going to go back and re-listen to it uh, again i'm i'm so grateful to every single one of you i feel like um as an inaugural conversation for Wyoming, which has just faced some really harsh, like anti-LGBTQ backlash in this last month, month, month and a half, um, from our high schools to Campbell County, to here in Cheyenne, to a uh, transgender woman being assaulted um, up in Casper. Uh, this conversation has been such a bomb and um, I'm, I'm grateful to you all taking the time uh, to share with us. And if we can uh, close out, if everyone can just offer, you know, two or three minutes or whatever is on your heart. Um, I don't know if I can time keep the spirit I, that might get me like extra purgatory points. You can tell me Father Greg later if that's good theology. Um, <laughs> but just if there's someone who's a member of your denomination or not, but I think it, it really helps to speak uh, to hear people who, who are leaders in our denominations. And I certainly felt that uh, across the street here at the depot in Cheyenne, uh, four years ago now, I think we had the vigil for Pulse for the um, 49 victims of the Pulse shooting. And uh, my friend and colleague, Deacon Mike Lehman from the Catholic Church uh, was there just to speak to people and to offer prayers. And I just noticed in particular, you know, that like, for Catholics in the audience to see a Catholic, you know, speak to them and their language, even though there were other Christians up on the stage, that that was just meaningful. Um, so if, if you can uh, just, if there's someone who's listening and they're can wondering- Can I say something they're... before we go? What's that, Ms. Dyer? Can I say something before we go? Yeah, please. So I just wanna say, you know, through my life, you know, I'm 42 years old and what I've learned is that when we speak 
you know, we can speak things into existence, you know, and that's how powerful we are. And that's what the Native people have taught us is that we're powerful beings. And so when we think and when we pray and when we do all these things, it's powerful. And so we need to watch out what we say at all times. And we need to always watch out what we feel and what we think, because we do have the tendency to hurt other people and we need to be very careful. So, you know, always walk and always hold others accountable and hold ourselves accountable, always. And that's what I want to say. Thanks so much, Ms. Dara. Yeah, folks, if you just want to take a turn and speak uh, directly to folks who are listening who might be questioning their value or their place or whether there's a space for them uh, in, in your church or your faith. Uh, and we'll start with um, Father Greg, because we keep picking on him. Um, I think the words that come to mind is when God made creation, and we even go back to the very beginning of Genesis, God looked at it and it was good. And I think we have to come to that basic goodness of every human person, you know, that every life has meaning, it has value, and to uphold that dignity. And, you know, and with that comes diversity and to celebrate that diversity and that goodness. So I really hope, and a message that I keep preaching is that we are all truly loved by God and we are precious children of God. And I tell you, in working with so many people who have faced traumas and sexual trauma, sexual abuse, whatever it may be in their lives, and people who are shame, you know, and experience that kind of shame in their life over the years, I just come back to this notion and the people that don't feel the preciousness of their lives. And so I hope we can get back and people can really feel the goodness uh, that they were created by God and however God created them to be, that we can just fully accept one another uh, for who they are. And, and so I just, I, I really, uh, I know I lived that through my own struggles of coming to that deep awareness, but I hope that message can be spread to everyone, that they can feel that inherent dignity and goodness of their life. Jordan? Hey, I mean, Father Greg, I actually had that written down was to, was to mention creation story and about how, you know, the, the term that I've that I've heard that I really love is we've all heard of original sin. Um, you know, if you're in the Christian tradition, you know about this idea of original sin. But what we're not often talked, what we're not often taught about is this idea of original blessing. And is that we were created good five times. In, in the first chapter of Genesis, God creates, the great creator creates, and he calls it good. They call it good. And then they say a second time, it was very good. And I think that's something we must remember. And I have to throw something out too, um, just, just me being in interfaith circles. No. I think it's maybe best said, or at least my favorite iteration of it is by Rabbi Hillel in the second century. I mean, somebody comes up to him and asks him, well, what is the meaning of the Torah? If you could sum up the Torah in just one sentence, what would it be? And they think that they've got him. They think that they've tricked this great rabbi, this great teacher. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. The rest is commentary. And I think that's really informative of, uh, how we can go forward in a sentence or less. <laughs> I love it. All right, Pastor Laura Beth. Yeah, um, you know, I always say that I, as a LGBTQ person, I have a LGBTQ agenda and it is this, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly to love God, to love my neighbor, and to love myself. And I, in my entire spiritual life, um, I was never taught to love myself. I was never even given permission or encouraged to love myself. And so um, 
I would add that as a very, very important commentary to Rabbi Hillel's um, statement that in loving our neighbor, we love ourselves and that and we, as we nurture ourselves, body, soul, and spirit, um, the love that we have, um, when my spirit loves my body, loves my soul, loves my spirit, and we put God into the midst of that love as the divine energy within us, that love overflows to our neighbors and it's sustainable um, because it, it starts within our core and it is infused with the divine that's in each of us. So. That is really good medicine. Thank you, Pastor Orba. Uh, speaking of good medicine, let's close out with Ms. Dara. Ms. Dara, what, what would you want people to know? What would I want people to know about not killing themselves? Like, I 100% not killing themselves. I don't want nobody to kill themselves. The I love everyone. I love everyone. I don't want no one to kill themselves. You know, it's it, it, it's a hard road. People think that, you know, they're the only one that's going to be affected, but everyone is affected. You know, no matter who, you know, there's always some kind of chain affection that just is, happens and it affects you forever. You know, if you have kids, if you, you know, have a parent, if you have, you know, siblings, anybody, it affects them. It affects them. So, um, you yeah. know, and, and sorry, can I say, I've heard you speak of, uh, on, you know, the creator and specifically, you know, the Northern Arapaho, Eastern Shoshone, uh, you know, the, the home uh, of Wind River, having very specific ideas about being created for, for a purpose and being created. Um, we all, yeah, we all have a purpose, you know, and so if we're still here on this earth today, we have a purpose. You know, those who get called home early are the ones who, you know, they fulfilled their purpose. You know, they're able to move on to, you know, the, the other side, as you want to call it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's different. I mean, so many times, you know, you hear people who are opposed to the church because of what has happened, you know, the, the, the bad stuff, you know, and, and we, we're, trying to, we're trying to heal from that, we're trying to move on from that, but it, it can't just happen. You know, it's like somebody saying, you know, we'll just get over it, you know, and we hear that so many times, move on, get over it, why can't you just accept it, you know, it, it, it's not that easy. And these are very touchy topics. And so, you know, I mean, I mean, how do we go forward? It's, it's hard. It's hard to go forward because, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to walk softly. We're trying to do it in a respectful manner. But how do you do that when the whole history has not been very favorable? You know, and so it, it's just, it's, it's a touchy subject when you want to involve the church. And so that's kind of like where I've been today is just, you know, um, on both sides of that. But, you know, I, I'm glad to be here. I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm I, here, you know, I'm here. I'm still trying to stay in the light, but it's hard sometimes, but I'm here, you know, so thank you. I'm so grateful for you, Dara. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I feel like everybody here, uh, but you especially Dara has such hard fought wisdom like everyone had to go through something to arrive um, at that place. So I just want to thank um, all of our panelists. Rodeo is about to start. Garth Brooks is in town tonight. It's going to get bonkers. Um, and I just want to remind everyone uh, as um, uh, our friend Jeremy from Grace Two, from Two Brothers has put in the link uh, that if you are struggling, you could reach out to Grace for Two Brothers. There is the National Suicide Hotline, the Suicide Crisis Hotline. I think Jordan is gonna drop that in the um, body of this. And um, the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is uh, always there for you as well as the Trans Lifeline. And I'll put links to those. Um, and thank you to our friends at the Trevor Project who we've been um, talking to about uh, perhaps doing a series like this with their help. Uh, I'm profoundly grateful to all of you. Um, you had, a, I'm sure, a million other things you could have done with your Friday afternoon, but I really hope that this conversation uh, bears really good fruit. So thank you all uh, for agreeing to come on. And we'll
we'll see you all on the other side. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It was great to meet all of you. Thank you. See you. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.